Good afternoon. Welcome to Arisat Network. Friends, today we are going to discuss constitutional justice and review. We will try to understand its meaning, its scope and how review is done in different other countries. And we will also try to understand the protection of rights. And for discussion on this very topic, we have in the studio Dr. Aparajita Kasyap. She is presently teaching in the University of School of Law and Legal Study in Guru Gobind Singh in Plus University. And she has keen interest in federalism and international relations and has contributed a number of articles in national and international journals. So I think her knowledge and experience will help us to understand this uh, topic and will give perspective how to uh, understand in Indian uh, set up the constitutional justice and review. So on your behalf, I welcome her for a recent lecture on this very topic. Welcome. Ma Thank you, Amrindji, and uh, welcome viewers. Uh, we ha uh, we have been seeing the rights, different rights in the Indian constitution over the past few days. But today I will just be doing a summary of constitution and, and not looking particularly into the Indian constitution, but I will be looking into how, what is the process of constitutional justice, that is how constitutional review is done, how rights are protected, how the constitution acts as an umpire. In, especially in federal countries. So if, uh, if we, we are to look at the constitution, there are certain things that we need to begin with. And the first thing that I would like you to know is, I'm just summarizing a couple of meanings which have been given. If we look at the le latest definition of constitution which has been given by Stone Sweet as, a, as recent as 2000, it is a body of meta norms that specify how all other legal norms are to be produced, applied, enforced, or interpreted. So it is a meta norm, it is a higher or a normative practice that must tell, that becomes a kind of a benchmark for all other laws to be tested. The second thing about explaining constitution is that Basically, it is a set of rules and principles of distribution of authority. Who gets what? Decision making and rights. What are the rights? If they get enshrined in the constitution, they become constitutional rights or fundamental rights. So these are some of the aspects of constitution. Then under, if you look at the rule of law, all those countries which follow rule of law, it is the supreme body of laws. Now, Constitution is one thing. All modern democracies have a constitution. Even a military dictatorship or an authoritarian regime has some kind of a dictator, of a constitution. For example, if we look at the fascist regime, then um, Hitler and Mussolini would rule by decrees. They did have a constitution, but it was practically non-existent. In the name it was there, but they would, as and when required, they would have their own decrees and they would rule according to that. Even military rules lay emphasis on constitution. If it was not so, why would they be wanting to make constitutional amendments, as was in the case of Pakistan? So any country, any government in a country gets legitimacy if it is backed by the constitution and therefore this becomes very important. So every country has a constitution, fair enough, but I would take you to another aspect which is called constitutionalism. So constitution and constitutionalism are not the same thing. If we have a constitution doesn't mean we are also indulging in constitutionalism because I would like to exp explain here there are three aspects about constitutionalism. So constitutionalism is more than a constitution. It must have a written and entrenched constitution. The commitment to accept the legit legitimacy of a constitution and be governed by the constitution must be present. And the provision for constitutional review must be there. Now, what I want to say here is that a state may have a constitution, yet it may be deficient in the commitment of the government to abide by the constitution. That is, it lacks constitutionalism. So a, co a country may have a constitution, but it may lack constitutionalism is what is important. And this is a distinction between constitution and constitutionalism. Now, if you look at 
constitutional law, if we talk about different kinds of laws in a country. Now, if we took a, uh, talk about constitutional law, these are the set of rules that define the distribution of governmental powers and as per the constitution. Now, these constitutional laws become very important in countries with written constitution. In um, an unwritten constitution, countries following unwritten constitution, it may not be so preeminent. Like it, uh, it is said in the last point that no special preeminence in countries with unwritten constitution. So constitutional law basically is the eminent law in a country with a written, entrenched and rigid constitution. Now if we look at how the constitution evolved in different countries, now we, we always had certain rules by which the government would govern. There were always certain documents, there were certain agreements, there were certain acts, statutes or customs by which the government would be governed. But what we lacked was a, a clear cut provision to define the role the authority, who gets what in governance. And the second thing was we needed to codify, we needed to put it, put it in a document, single document. And this is why when we talk about written and unwritten constitution, the distinction between a written and an unwritten constitution is the absence of codification in the latter. That is, in an unwritten co constitution, the codification has not been done. So, for example, just a layman's example, if I have to refer to the document, to the constitution of Britain, I would be looking at the Act of Parliament 1911, I would be looking at the Bill of Rights, I would be looking at the Magna Carta, and, and if I have to refer to the constitution of India, because it is codified, it, it is in a single document, so it is easier to refer to that constitution. So whatever be the nature of constitution, the, the, if we go back to the first time the term was used was during the glorious, glorious revolution of 1688 in Britain. And James II, who was deposed then, he was accused of violating the fundamental constitution of the land. And so we have, we started thinking of some law of the land which was very sacred and nobody could... Um, disobey those laws and these were then called the fundamental constitution. So this was the first time we talk about a fundamental constitution, the concept of constitution. But the constitution making is still a later process. It comes after around 100 years. In, it comes after the Philadelphia Convention in the United States, which was held in 1787, and this was the emergence of fully codified written constitutions. So all modern constitutions trace their origin or genesis to this 1787 Philadelphia Convention in the United States. Now, after this, then the post-World War scenario, that is the, after the First World War and the Second World War, many nations, they started adopting new constitutions because till now, constitution was not the main concern. Now, when they know what is a constitution, now that they be become nation states, they gain independence, constitution becomes mandatory. And so they, either if they were capable enough, they would write a new constitution. If they were not capable or if they were colonized, then a, 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 a constitution was thrust upon them by the colonizers. So it was an imposed constitution, but still they had some kind of a constitution. And so it went on from the 1940s, and it continued till the 1990s when there were countries where the decolonization were get uh, the process was on, newly independent countries were writing their own constitution. If they were not able to write, they were adopting constitutional provisions from other countries. They had, they get, got help in writing their constitutions. And suddenly comes the disintegration of USSR and the end of Cold War in the early 1990s. And then we come and come across a new concept of constitutional designs, especially in the East European nations. Now, if we look at, now, so much, so much for the evolution of constitution. Now that a constitution has emerged, now that there is a desire to have a constitution, we started making constitution in the following method, methods. So we, there were mostly three or four methods adopted to make constitution. 
and whenever we had a constitution it was a result of some break away with the past we wanted a new constitution because either it was becoming redundant or the scenario in the country the political scenario was changing or we were getting independent from being a colonized countries so we had to rebel or revolt and make a new beginning and that is when constitution started coming so it was either a result of a war revolution or rebellion that we needed a new constitution so the constitution how was the constitution made in different countries in many of the countries it was a fundamental political act like if we look at britain it is whatever the acts and statutes are the outcome of the deliberation of the legislature or the british parliament in some other countries we had specific bodies created which would deliberate and form constitutions and constituent assembly which is a name given to them for example if we look at the indian constitution we had a constituent assembly which was formulated but before the britishers had left and this constitution assembly deliberated and the um, on a particular date the deliberations ended and were culminated in the adoption of a constitution now in many other countries the uh, constitution is a compilation of acts statutes and customary laws so you you come you borrow some from here some from there but within your own country and yet in other countries they adopted provisions from other constitutions like india we have adopted certain features from other constitutions we have borrowed from irish constitution we have borrowed from south african constitution so this is we are borrowing provisions so these are the four important ways in which constitutions are formulated now if we look at the nature of constitution what is a constitution is it a political outcome is it is it a, a executive action if we the best thing that can be said about a constitution that it is a legal effort and that's why modern constitutions are said to be contracts of people with each other and if we look at the preamble of indian constitution or the united states constitution they begin with we the people so we the people give to ourselves this constitution the very fact that we talk about we the people talks about people sovereignty that people are supreme and it is them who have been instru instrumental in formulation of the constitution so if we look at modern constitutions these are actual contracts of people with each other but these con the people the people cannot negotiate contracts and they cannot give it a shape so the first thing that we require are political elites who physically negotiate and give a shape to the contracts of the people so the political elite is an important consideration this political elite is the one which guides the formation or adoption of certain principles in the constitution now the second thing about this contract is that this contract has been signed because the person who who is in power wants the opponents when they come to power to abide by certain rules or to indulge in constitutional limitation or limited government so this this thing is in mind that when the other other group or the opponent comes to power they also should have a constitutional restraint and that is why this contract is signed the third is that a, because legislature or executive or judiciary are involved in the making of the constitution so if there is any conflict which arises due to the provisions of the constitution it has to be judged by a referee or a third party so the third party resolution of conflicts becomes very important now the fourth thing about this contract is that especially in unitary unitary countries we don't have central state disputes or state state disputes these disputes are a characteristic of federal polity so federal polity especially needs an empire and this empire is a written constitution not an unwritten one now what is this contract this contract if we look at the nature of this contract it is an incomplete contract because there are certain provisions of this contract which have been listed but the moment there is a failure to abide by the contract then the intervention is by a third party or the court so this is an incomplete contract 
the the second thing about this contract is that it is a relational contract that each party has an interest in seeing that the other parties ob obey their obligation that is every government has it has rights government and people have rights but they also have certain duties so it is a relational contract that if you have rights you have certain duties and this is what is always being watched in this contract now if we having said that the constitution has emerged then what were the considerations or what were the important features which were adopted while making the constitution the most important thing is that it should be of reasonable length but if we look at the us constitution because this is the first written constitution fair enough it is reasonable length it's almost around 8000 words including the amendments but if we look at the indian constitution the length of the indian constitution defies the first characteristic so reasonable length but of course we justify in india that the the reason why we had a lengthy constitution was that we didn't want to leave any ambiguity we were a new democracy we wanted everything to be put on pen, pen and paper therefore the length the reasonable length in indian condi condition was not adhered to but by and large the reasonable length is you adopt this system the second thing about constitution that is that it should not be a transplanted constitution because the local conditions are different so whatever constitution that is written has to be in sync with local traditions so mere transplanting of constitutions will not suffice you have to have a constitution which looks into the traditions the needs and circumstances of the country in which they are written now every constitution has been written at a certain point in time now if there there is technological changes there are modern developments so if we stop on the date when this constitution was written there are certain changes which the constitution cannot accommodate so those provisions related to those developments and changes will not be found in a constitution so to account for this development and changes we need the constitution to be adapting adaptable so to have adaptability in the constitution what we incorporated was amendment so as and when required there would be certain changes but of course the criteria was that these changes wouldn't be easy it it is easy in unwritten constitutions but written constitutions by and large are rigid because we do not want the changes to come by very easily there has to be a restriction on how to bring about changes nehru had said that modern constitution is all about change it's all about amendments so to have a progressive outlook we need to change the constitution so how to change the constitution is written in the constitution itself for example indian constitution under article 368 gives the elaborate procedure of how to amend the constitution the fourth characteristic of constitution is that it must have a catalog of rights this catalog of rights is Uh, called by different names in different countries for example us calls it the bill of, bill of rights india calls it the fundamental rights so it must have catalog of rights then there are other uh, uh, smaller uh, con considerations while you write a constitution that the language should be simple there should be no ambiguity because the moment you have ambiguity you need somebody to interpret the constitution and the entire purpose of constitution's simplicity gets defeated now if once we have why did we write a constitution if we want to explain it the purpose of constitution would be that it is the ultimate source of state authority all the governments draw their power from the constitution it is from the constitution that they know which is their limit which is their authority how where to stop what work to do the second purpose of constitution is that it describes how statutes are made statutes are parliamentary legislations any enactment by parliament now third it lays down the legislative procedures for example in india everything from the sitting of the houses of parliament to how there would be a joint sitting convened every legislative procedure how committees are to be formed all this are stated in the constitution because we don't want to leave ambiguities and there has to be clarity now the 
another purpose of the constitution is to enumerate the powers of different institutions if for example if in india if we have an interstate council or if we have an election commission then all these institutions which have even if they have been formed later on what is their power what is their role what is their limitation all this is the role of constitution the constitution has to tell us all this now supposing we have different institutions then how are these for example we have a planning commission we have a finance finance commission we have uh, uh, interstate council we have zonal councils now these are different institutions with different roles how are these to interact how are these to interact so that the interaction is free of conflict and this all this is mentioned in the constitution and the last purpose of constitution is how equality is to be promoted because it is not it is not about certain developed democracies where all these things are taken care of all the and newly independent countries which came into uh, existence or in which got their independence after the 1950s they were diverse societies they were they were caste ridden uh, caste ridden would be indian example but they were class ridden societies they were an elite group and a working class so all these were societies which were fraught with intense inequalities and how to promote equality was one major purpose of constitution because the the inequalities would be so intense that there were an immense civil war in these countries especially if we look at the african example then all these countries had were were uh, fighting civil wars and because there were certain inequalities with respect to how much resources they controlled or in terms of the income criteria so one aspect then becomes equality and how to promote equality for example in india we do it through reservation there are systems in different constitutions and equality is also promoted by incorporating rule of law rule of law it one of the aspects is that equal protection by law and equal punishment for every person equality before law and if if we have rule of law it eventually takes care of one thing one aspect that there are no different laws for different classes of people and the other aspect about equality is that you provide them some leverage or some advantage and uh, so that they come up to the level of the other classes in the society now if it uh, when i was talking about the amendment procedure now this this becomes very important because all the nations are evolving and an evolving country needs a evolving constitution at, as well so if we had a rigid constitution it would not be able to cope with the changing aspirations or changing aspects so we wanted certain changes and these are called amendment procedures they are amendment procedures are different in different countries they are simple in unwritten constitution countries like united kingdom because these are only like legislative these are only simple acts of parliament passed by a simple majority to complex where you have the us example so th that means the the amendments have to be passed there's a special procedure the amendments have to be passed introduced by three fourth members then passed by at least three fourth of the states so these are quite rigid uh, amendment procedures mainly done to ensure in a federation that the center does not usurp the rights of the states then there then there are certain provisions which may not be amended at all for example uh, the number of representatives that the states send in us is one right which which cannot be amended then um, an ordinary parliamentary statute may alter provisions because it is a flexible constitution but for other as i said for other constitutions we need special procedures for example i gave you this example in india we have specifically three methods of amendment certain provisions are changed by ordinary or simple majority and unfortunately these are some of the important amendments the second category of amendment is when you need a special majority and most of the provisions of constitution are amended by this and third is uh, special majority and you have to back that up by at least half of the states more than half of the states backing that 
amendment. So mm -hmm. the third category is mo mostly to do with center state relations. Anything which goes out of the hands of the state, that has to be protected. So we have adopted this third method of amendment when you need ratification by more than half of the states. Now, if we look at the role of constitution, the first role of constitution is that constitution helps in decision making. How does it determine the decision making rules? It establishes the basic rules of decision making. It confers power on specific groups or institutions to propose policy. So we, we know that there are certain bodies in India, there are certain bodies who have been, uh, they have been conferred special power to propose policies related to their area of jurisdiction. And this is the decision making power which has been delegated by the constitution to these bodies. Now, some bodies or institutions even have the right to amend, reject or approve proposals. So this, all this has been granted by the constitution. For example, any financial provision or any distribution of uh, finances between center, state or to different institutions is uh, decided by the planning commission in India. Now if the planning commission and, and of course and also the finance, finance commissions, if they are likely to propose something, the government can reject or adopt those proposals and likewise if the government is going to give them certain directions, they can amend or reject because they have constitutional authority. Now and the last contribution of constitution in decision making is it specifies the resources needed to make policies that is who gets what is specified by the constitution. Now it puts the most important thing that it does is it puts a limitation on governance. There are certain units, institutions and then you have a constitution which limits your powers, your authorities and it ensures that there is a fair degree of separation of power and the different organs of the government do not transgress into the domain of each other. And the second limitation it puts on the government is in matters of civil rights, that no governmental en encroachment can happen on the rights of the people except under specified circumstances. This is important, under specified circumstances, this means that Nobody can claim that my civil rights are absolute. There are certain conditions which have been specified which say that your fundamental rights can be taken away. For example, in India, during emergency, we, have, we do dilute our fundamental rights, but we cannot say that uh, the government is encroaching because there are certain needs of the hour in which the government has to encroach. So this provision or this limitation or this catch is important that it has to be taken away only under specified circumstances. Looking into the second aspect of constitutional limitation and that is rights, if we look at rights, we know that rights are constraints on the government because it becomes a duty of the government to provide our rights. So these are substantive constraints on the governments. And there are supreme courts or constitutional courts to protect the right against governmental incursions. So there are certain countries, mostly in Europe we had constitutional courts which protect the rights of the people and in India and United States for example, not, uh, I will not say United States because it's the supreme court is in India, the judiciary protects it in United States. So the governmental incursion and that makes the uh, aspect of liberty supreme because the moment you know that the right to liberty will not be encroached by the government and there is a constitutional backing of that provision, then the people are sure that the right to life, liberty and property would be protected. Now problems with fundamental rights always occur in, a, in, in any country. Because the moment you give them fundamental rights and these are fundamental, so the government becomes limited. And the moment there is a limitation, then the government is, is not happy about it because every, every it, it, what is international relations or what is politics, it is all about assuming more and more power. And the moment we try to curb the power, there are going to be intense reactions. Now, the mo most important problems with fundamental rights are there are disagreement about the content of right. What 
is what right what is which right is more important and on this then we we have disagreements for example between the left the left is more asking about social rights then it it tries to do away with the right to property whereas the right would want the right to property be entrenched deeply and the second problem with fundamental rights are how these rights how these rights are enforced the enforcement of right then becomes a problem now if we look at the rights there are two kinds of issues which is uh, emerge one is called hierarchical relationship that is the hierarchical relationship between the rights and obligations rights are more or less absolute as we know any act of government violating rights are declared unconstitutional but the the last line is the catch judiciary does the balancing act by determining that rights are not absolute now if if for example if we were to talk about this now uh, when a state decides to build an airport the right to property of an individual is outweighed by the general interest of the public so the people may uh, object that my right to property is going but because it is in the larger interest of a larger group of people then the court will intervene and it will say that your rights are not absolute because the greater good is the goal that we are looking at and we would compensate you for whatever loss that you are making and the second thing is that there is a scope of obligation imposed on public authority by rights provisions now the duty of the, it becomes the duty of the government if i have a right it becomes the duty of the government to do certain things to promote my rights to refrain from doing certain things so that these are called positive and negative duties that is i will refrain from doing certain things because it will impinge on the rights of the citizens now if you look at constitutional justice if because i said there are problems with Uh, enforcement of fundamental rights there are problems because the government puts a limitation and therefore we want some kind of a judicial process to be happening and this is called constitutional justice institutions and procedures established by constitution are there for the protection of fundamental rights uh, sorry to interrupt you we have a call from kerala so good afternoon friend please ask your question hello i want to ask yeah yeah i want yes. to ask one question yeah At first, uh, Indian Constitution have three ninety five articles and eight schedules. Presently, how many articles are there and how many schedules are there? How many articles and how many schedules are there? Okay, um, I I can't give you the exact figure, but it's around four hundred articles, mm -hmm. and I think nine schedules. Okay. I I. You may just check with it because I did not update yeah, my notes. Yeah, actual uh, actual yeah. question. So. Yeah, now continue. Now, methods of providing justice. If, when we talk about hmm. constitutional justice, then the constitution. How how does constitution do justice? And there are three methods. One is that you involve the judiciary. You continue. Uh, hmm. One is that you involve the judiciary. The second is that we bring in special courts, which are called constitutional courts. and the third is that we give the special power to the to the same judiciary and this power special power is called judicial review now if we come to the concept of judicial review or constitutional review the first thing that lord bryce had said that this is the rights protecting service provided by the judiciary so it is its its role is very important and especially he was only thinking about protecting the individual rights now the second important reason why constitutional review must be in place is that the courts have to guard against improper implementation of laws and regulations because the law making is the domain of legislation but execution of those laws are the role of executive and executive as we know in any situation becomes tends to become more powerful so how are the laws made by the legislature implemented becomes very important and this is one area of review the third important reason why we need a constitutional review is to guard against the undue encroachment by the government on the liberty of the people and for this then we have two ways of guarding encroachment 
one is judicial review by the judiciary and second as I said it is review by the constitutional courts. Now one important thing that I would like to say, tell here that in UK the courts cannot overrule the legislative decisions because UK has adopted parliamentary sovereignty whereas in India constitution is sovereign. So any acts of parliament are likely to be uh, looked into or probed by the um, by the judiciary in, in within which is within the power of judicial review and and if we talk about R. N. Lippert, he ha he had uh, analyzed around 80 constitutions, and out of that, four he he clearly said that there are four democratic systems which have strong system of judicial okay. review, and one is United States, another is Canada, Germany, and India. So India also is in the league of those far powerful countries which. Uh, have adopted a s good system of constitutional review. Uh, we have a call from West Bengal. Let us take it first. Uh, good afternoon, friend. Please ask your question. Um, this is the first thing that we have to do. We have to do a lot of things. 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 We have we want to uh, collaborate, the, uh, it has to be given due consideration. So international aspect also, it is written in the constitution to that to give effect to international treaties and agreements. There are certain provisions and it is important consideration in the constitution. Okay, so about the question, there were 12 schedule and number of uh, okay. articles you make. Okay, then do we have another uh, call from? Okay. So I like to do 12, 12 to do land. Because I was carrying this copy, so. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now, hmm. no, continue. Okay, so hmm. con continuing with my lecture now. Um, what are constitutional courts? We don't follow this system in India. The constitutional courts are exclusive or mostly practiced in um, Europe, some African countries. There are certain countries in Asia which also follow the system of constitutional courts. The exclusive and final constitutional jurisdiction belong to these courts. They, these courts only settle constitutional disputes and nothing else. So their mandate is no other judicial dispute settlement. They are formally detached from judiciary and legislature. So they are not, they from the regular judiciary, they are not part of the regular judiciary. They are detached from the judiciary or legislature. And mostly they review legislations before they are enforced. But they review it after the legislation. So the, after the legislation has been proceeded with, then, mm. the, then the, uh, the constitutional courts, they review the legislations. The modes of review are two. One is called abstract review, and the second is called concrete review. Now I would like to read out what is an abstract review. It is a preventive or a priori okay. review. We have another caller from Uttarakhand. So, good afternoon, friend. Please ask your question. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, may I ask, ma'am, uh, in the initial, uh, what you were saying, uh, constitution and constitutionalism. So, may I ask, what exactly constitutionalism means? Constitutionalism means what? What means government or people? Constitutionalism. Constitutionalism. Constitutionalism is for the Constitution should be followed by all people. So your constitutionalism uh, should be followed by government or the people of the uh, government? Okay, good question. Yeah, good question. Yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting question. Constitutionalism is basically, most importantly, the commitment on part of the government to abide by the uh, provisions of the mm. Constitution. 
Okay, and constitution for everybody. Constitution, of course, because uh, uh, the constitution of India starts with we the people of India. So it is understood that people will ab abide by the constitution because we have given ourselves this constitution. But the uh, constitutionalism is the commitment on part of the government to abide by the provisions and commitments as stated in the constitution. Okay. That's uh, why I said that hmm. a country can have a constitution, but it can lack constitutionalism. So you have a constitution, a written document, but the commitment or the uh, mindset of the government to abide by that constitution may be lacking. So these are two different things. Okay, even so, but there are 395 articles and 12 uh, scheduled okay. in total. So we this can is the say. revised one. Yeah, uh, yes. Responding to the to the first question, uh, he has bailed me out. There are 395 articles and there are 12 schedules. Okay, total yeah. number. Sorry about the confusion. Okay, now continue. Okay, and uh, okay, so the, now I would like to continue with my the modes of review. There are two modes of review in a constitutional court. One is an abstract review, and the second is a concrete rev review. What is an abstract review? It is a preventive or a priori review. There are no concrete cases or controversies. The elected officials, mainly the opposition parties, they refer a law for review to the constitutional court after it has been adopted. And the concrete review is the second kind which is initiated by the judiciary. So the most important difference between abstract and concrete is that whereas abstract is initiated by political opponents and uh, concrete is initiated by the judiciary. It is initiated by judiciary and then the answer to constitutional question decides the constitution constitutionality of the issue in question. It is, it is one of the stages in ongoing, during the ongoing litigation, but abstract was after the legislation has been proceeded. And the concrete, third thing about concrete review is that it is by an ordinary judge and address to the constitutional court. So these are some of the methods of constitutional review. If we look at the models of constitution, these are not the types of constitution that we generally read about, written, unwritten, rigid, flexible. These are the models of constitution on how changes are made, who is more important. So if we look at the first model of constitution, it is called the absolutist constitution. The creation and the changes, absolutist as the name suggests, it is absolutist. That means the rulers are above the law, the creation and changes are highly centralized and so because we are moving towards democracy, this can be feasible only in an undemocratic regime. So these are non-viable and non-existent constitutions. If you look at the legislative supremacy constitution, the second kind, and this is in which as we talked about UK's case, parliamentary is parliamentary sovereignty or legislature is supreme. Now, judicial review of any of the parliamentary acts or legislative actions is prohibited. So, whatever acts the parliament passes is almost going to get through without being interrupted. There are rights are granted by the parliament, so it becomes a political issue because governments it is the government which is controlling what kind of rights are being given to the people. And that's why the third thing that I have said about this is that it's almost it's extinct, it's going away. We have four examples of unwritten constitutions, Bhutan, Israel, New Zealand and United Kingdom. Of, of them, two have started writing their constitution, making it written. United Kingdom and New Zealand are the two important constitutions which uh, ado have adopted the legislative supremacy principle, so therefore it is, they are called almost extinct constitutions. And the third model of constitution is called the higher law constitution. The type 3 constitution is the most prevalent kind of constitution in the world. The legislative so sovereignty is rejected. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, we have another caller from Punjab. Uh, good afternoon friend, please ask your question. Yes, what is governance? Okay, governance and constitutional relation. 
yeah. between governance and country. Yes. Uh, good governance uh, emerges from the constitution because it is the constitution which has all the provisions of governance written. But the practical aspects of governance cannot, could not have been adopted because supposing there are certain things which India now faces, for example, coalition, which we did not have when, which we did not think of when we had adopted the constitution. So there are certain changes which are bringing about. So these changes are adopted by amend through amendments, and by and large, the rules of governance are set by the constitution. But there are certain aspects which may not be covered by the constitution, and the mindset and uh, the intense in. Uh, intensity of the government or intention of the government to abide by the constitution may vary from what is prescribed and that is when we don't adhere to good governance. So actually the scheme of governance is described by the constitution. That's a direct relationship. Okay. The higher law constitution when we are talking about it le rejects the legislative supremacy. It says that uh, it is not the legislature which is supreme and that is when we have legislature and judiciary fighting for one upmanship. They say judicial, judiciary says that because I can indulge in judicial review, it is judiciary which is supreme and legislature says that it is only the legislative acts which give existence to the, either the executive and judiciary, then therefore I am supreme and this is the common conflict in a higher law constitution. Then there are judicial mode of enforcing rights. If people, people's rights are encroached upon or they are taken away, they can directly appeal in the courts. And in India, they can directly appeal to the highest court of India, that is the Supreme Court. Then high law constitution have, have provisions for amendment and the amendment procedures are not easy. There are tough procedures. There have to be different procedures for amendment. And the high law constitutions are what many of the political thinkers have called good constitution. And the example of higher law constitution is India and United States. Now, I would like to end the discussion here by trying to just summarize what has been said so far. If we look at the different constitutions, I have a couple of figures to support that rights, a bill of rights. So out of the 193 constitutions that we know, around 180 have adopted Bill of Rights in some form or the other. Then uh, there are four important countries which do not have written constitutions, Bhutan, Israel, UK, New Zealand. Bhutan and Israel have started the process. They are moving towards a written constitution. And if we look at constitutional justice, the one thing that we have to keep in mind that this was not there when the constitution started. The process of constitution, the evolution of constitution begins since 1787 and uh, then 1787 was the Philadelphia Convention but it was only in 1857 that the concept of constitutional justice that is we talk about review. Then since 1980s, because of certain changes, economic changes, we start talking about new constitutionalism. And one question which we, throughout the discussion, anybody could have asked, why is it that political elites want to delegate power to the constitutional judges? This is, this is very difficult to judge or it is difficult to understand why the political elites delegate power to the constitutional judges. One aspect could be that they always fear the opposition that if, if they do not have a referee or an umpire, so one, one, when they are in opposition, the opposition is likely to overtake all the power. So this could be a possible explanation, but it is still not explained. And then there are certain things which become very important in all this. One is that the constitution, in, if we look at all the countries, there are two important purpose of constitution. One, the most important purpose is to secure fundamental rights or to, to human rights or basic rights to the people. And the second is, if it is a federal country, it has to supervise federalism because the center has a tendency of usurping more power or it is in trying to encroach into the realm of the states. So that has to be protected or guarded against and that is the role of judiciary, uh, sorry, constitution. Now, when we started with the 1803 Marbury versus Madison 
case. We never knew that judicial review would come to this extent that it is the most important aspect of conflict in a state. If we look at India, the, the concept of judicial review is a major, major cause of conflict between the legislature and the judiciary and this is where they try to prove that which, which organ of the government is more important. Okay. And review has brought in litigations. Uh, we have a call from Kolkata. Uh, good afternoon, friend. Please ask your question. Um, hello? Yeah, yeah. Please ask your question. Um, please ask. Yes, please ask. Yes, अमेंडमेंट आप कितने हुए हैं और क्या जोड़ा गया है तो ये तो पर्टिकुलर अमेंडमेंट बिकॉज वी हैव ओवर हंड्रेड अमेंडमेंट्स इन द कंस्टिट्यूशंस सो टू या थ्री द मेजर अमेंडमेंट यू कैन टॉक अबाउट सो टॉकिंग अबाउट ऑल व्हाट हैज बीन एडेड इन ऑल दिस you want to know about the amendments, the amendments in the constitution? Hello? Disconnect. So, the major amendment is about that. Because all the amendments are about that. So, tell us about that. Major amendments are the most important amendments are the 42nd and the 44th amendment. And these were the amendments which were done under political consideration. The 42nd amendment was done by Mrs. Gandhi when the Congress was almost going out of power and 70, the 77, yeah, 1977 and the 44th amendment was done by the Janata party when it comes to power. So if we look at the 42nd amendment and the 44th amendment, it is just a reversal. What, what was done in 42nd was undone in the 44th amendment. For example, the uh, one, one important aspect was the uh, tenure of parliament was increased from five to six years. Yeah. Then in the 44th amendment it was back, brought back to uh, five. five years. Then um, another important amendment was uh, about the fundamental duties which were incorporated. And Panchayati Raj, Panchayati Raj 92. 92nd and 93rd 92. amendment, yes. 51 amendment, 51st amendment we had the fundamental duties which were incorporated. So provision of amendment to uh, uh, give a kind of uh, vitality to a constitution yes. as its uh, time requires and the people yeah. aspiration comes out. We need to incorporate in the constitution and give it a kind of to that. Yes, because yeah. I, 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 if, if it has to be a living constitution, then it has to have amendments. Yeah. So purpose of the amendment is this. This, yes. Yeah. Very right. right. So, uh, uh, just, just, uh, I would just yeah. like to conclude by saying that the constitution has established one important fact that if procedures are not followed in producing statutes or judicial decisions or acts or agreements, then the act is constitutionally invalid. And this, is, this would also be the answer to that gentleman's question on governance. Right. That if, if you are not following procedures, then uh, you, the, all these acts are invalid. So the, you, have, you have to look into the substantive aspects of decisions or acts or enactments or statutes as well as the procedural aspects of uh, any amendment or law making procedure. So one uh, constitution gives liberty and other will limit it also. Yes. Within that range, within that uh, limit, uh, say, uh, region you have to work otherwise the constitution the, will pull you. Yeah, it, it is declared ultra virus. Yeah. So the, the most important thing about conclusion is, uh, about constitution is that it, it does give certain powers and authority, but at the same time, as he said, uh, Mr. Amrava said that it limits the authority mm -hmm. of e either the people or the government because even people have limitation. There are certain provisions in the constitution which say yes. that rights are not absolute. They can be taken away in certain needs. Yeah, people, government or any institution, organizations, yes. yeah, within the framework of the constitution they have to they work. Have to work yeah. or Planning commission has role to the people, just plan to the uh, any uh, a program for the country and the ministry or the department will implement it. And this way a separate division of power is given to the oh, yes. And one thing which I wanted to say was about uh, judicial review. Mm -hmm. For example, if, if it is judicial review in India, the, it, it has been, the Supreme Court has been empowered for judicial review. Uh, so if we look at the original jurisdiction of Supreme Court, there are two aspects of original jurisdiction. One is to 
settle all conflicts between center state, state, state or center and a group of states on the other side. And the second uh, aspect of original jurisdiction is it, is it has to look into the encroachment issues of fundamental rights. And if at all the fundamental rights are encroached, it can protect those rights by issuing writs. Okay. So, we were talking about the con uh, constitutional provision for the different uh, commission and different other board and the commissions. So, in case uh, suppose some uh, thing which is uh, uh, provision or say programs are made by the um, uh, government of India and the state government and as we are, uh, we have recently the thing has come into the limelight that uh, uh, Supreme Court is asking why you are doing this, why you are yeah, not yeah. doing so. So on the government's level, to commenting on the government level by the um, judiciary body, to what extent there, uh, there is a provision in the constitution? Yeah, they are, they, is this any kind of provision or not such kind of provision? There is, uh, there is no uh, explicit provision as such. This is called judicial activism or judicial overreach. Okay. And there is no provision, but by the fact that you have allowed judicial review, mm -hmm. this is the plea that they take. And so this from is, here they are yes, from the judicial review they get this power okay. to, because uh, they feel that if this legislative action is not uh, complete or competent, then I have the right to encourage. So here only they get the power only to comment upon, not to ask to do it. Uh, no, not to ask to do it. Yeah, no, because uh, yeah, they don't, they can't ask to do it. But okay. they have in certain cases in which the judiciary. Okay, we'll discuss has it uh, yeah. before we take up the question from the caller from Uttar Pradesh. Good afternoon, friend. Please ask your question. Ji, sawal puchiye. Hello. Ji, sawal puchiye. Is it role as guardian of the constitution? Is it? It is role. Mm -hmm. As guardian of the constitution, as guardian is is the court guardian uh, yes, of, the, yeah. of the constitution. It, it is the Supreme Court in India is the guardian of the constitution, yeah. and that is where it derives the power of judicial review. Any political encroachment mm -hmm. on the constitution or any tampering with the basic structure of the constitution is to be looked into by the judici uh, judiciary and it is all these acts are declared null, declared ultra virus. These are unconstitutional acts. So the court is the guardian of the constitution. Okay. But general people feel that they can only have power to interpret the law. No. Legislation no. Law. Interpretation is also there because hmm. if there are ambiguous pro provisions, hmm. judiciary has to interpret the constitution. Right. But it, it also, the power of judicial review gives it the power to uh, be, become the guardian of the constitution. It protects the constitution. Okay. So, um, uh, uh, suppose uh, le uh, uh, what happens that uh, Supreme Court or the courts says though this is not the um, things which comes under the governance rule of the governance, but what happens the legislature moves, uh, brings a bill and then make a law and then they start uh, doing such kin kind of things. Is there such kind of uh, instances in India? Or where, like, where legislature has yeah. ignored the judiciary? Yeah, uh, by bringing a law or the legislature in the We will see it in uh, recent times uh, about this uh, bill on homosexuality also. Yeah. The Supreme Court, but all the, all the legislature, even the state legislature are saying that we will uh, go we against will review this, it and review it and rethink, rethink about okay. this. Okay. So, well friends, uh, with this word, we like to conclude the lecture. I thank all of you for watching the lecture. And on your behalf, I thank Dr. Prajita Kasyap for giving such an insightful lecture on this very topic. Thank you very much.